double play. We needed that. Yeah, lucky thing, too. He hadn't got a ball by him all night. I sure hope he tightens up soon. Now, between these injuries and the double-headed tomorrow, we are short on reliefers. How about that new kid, Tommy Richards? Everybody seems pretty high on him. Oh, he can throw, but he's a new grounder, Hank. He's never faced one of these big leaguers in his life. You think he's got it? Yeah, I think maybe he has. Of course, we'll never know until he's out there trying. Yep, there's always got to be a first time. Go talk to him, Hank. Look him over. See if he's got it in here. See if he wants his team to win as bad as he wants to pitch. Maybe take him down to the bullpen and let him throw a couple. Skipper will want to use him as soon as he's ready. Check. Well, no hits, no errors. Hey, that double play was a break the way they've been teeing off on us. Now keep up the good work, Jake. Yeah, how's it going, Tom? Think you'll last out there, Hank? No, too early to tell. It's only the second inning. Good pitcher gets better when the pressure's on. He begins to smell the victory. Yeah, I guess you're right, Hank. Like in a World Series game. Pressure's really on. That's when you see if they've really got it. Yeah, that's the idea, kid. Remember Harry Brickeen in 46? He won three World Series games. Oh, his second win was really something. It was the sixth game. Boston expected to wrap up the series that day. Yeah, but the cat held him. He got into one real jam, and the Red Sox were about to tie it up. But old Harry really bore down on him. Blew that ball past Culberson, the same for Pesky. Two strikeouts in a row. Well, and I don't ever get the idea. A pitcher wins ball games all by himself, boy. Oh, Brakeen had a ball club behind him. Guys like Harry Walker in the outfield. You don't have to be afraid to let him hit the ball. You've got a team out there just waiting for it. I know, Hank. But remember what happened to Murray Dixon in the last game of that series? Little Murray Dixon has pitched a beautiful game up to now. He allowed only three hits and one base on balls. Up till the eighth here, where the Boston Red Sox have taken over and came up with a single and a double. Now with runners on second and third and nobody out, Manager Eddie Dyer is taking Dixon out and sending in Harry Bikini. After pitching nine tough innings yesterday, the cat comes in to face Wally Moses, who represents the winning run. Two strikes on Moses. Bikini winds the pitch. Strike three called. He struck him out. Now it's pesky the hitter. It's a drive to right field. Slaughter comes in fast. He has it for out number two. And now as we go into the last half of the eighth, the ball game's all tied up at three and three. Bob Clinger to come in to pitch for Boston. Eno Slaughter to lead off for the Cardinals. The pitch swung on. And Slaughter is safe at first with what could be the winning run. Kurowski punts. It's a pop-up. Clinger racing over. He takes it for the first out. Two out now with Slaughter on first. He might go. Harry Walker, the hitter. The pitch. There goes Slaughter. Walker singles to center. Culberson up with the ball. Slaughter's taken for third. Here's the throw to relay man. Pesky. Slaughter. Slaughter isn't stopping. He's coming home. Pesky gets around for a throw to the plate. Too late. Slaughter slides in with a winning run all the way from first on a single by Harry Walker. That was the ball game and the series. Well, you wouldn't think that play of Slaughter's was possible, would you? <laughs> Pesky sure didn't think so. Anybody knows you can't score from first on a single unless you play ball like the Cardinals do. That's kind of a tradition with the Cardinals, isn't it? Taking chances? Yeah, doing what's not expected. Gas house stuff, taking chances, winning ball games. Hey, kid, there's a guy you want to watch. The only safe way to pitch to him is low and behind him.
gun. Boy, just like that, we wouldn't run behind. Makes no difference who's pitching, kid. Ball game's never safe as long as there's a man at plate with a bat in his hand. I remember it was 1944 when we were playing the World Series with the Browns. We wondered if we'd get hits off guys like Gale House, Sid Jakuki. Here's the pitch from Jakuki. Swung on and missed. Strike two for Danny Lettweiler. Jakuki winds, throws, strike three. Looks like the Cards are having trouble with this guy. Here's Johnny Hop. He slaps a liner to second. Gutteridge boots it. It's getting away from him, and Hop is safe at first. Now it's Stan Musial at the plate. This man's coiled, crouching stance is something to see. He hit 347 this season, and from all appearances during his first three seasons with the Cardinals, he could be one of baseball's all-time great hitters. Here's the pitch. A long, long drive into right center. Into the stands, a home run. Cardinals two, Browns nothing. Yep, even when you shut him out, you need somebody like Stan the man to bring in some runs. Somebody the other pitchers can't get up. Well, you just let the batters worry about that part, boy, and you concentrate on pitching. That's enough for one guy to do even when you're hot like Mort Cooper was in that 44 series. He struck out 12 men in that fifth game. Only two pitchers ever did better than that in the World Series. But when he walked George McQuinn in that sixth inning to load the bases with one out, he only had a one-run lead. Mort really had his hands full. But he got Cyril on a called third strike. And Chrisman went down too, taking the Brownie rally right along with him. Things get pretty rough on a pitcher in a spot like that. Yeah, I guess. I'd be darned if I could see how it gets any worse than sitting in a dugout, watching everybody else play the ball games. I'm beginning to think I ought to be paying to get in the park. They're tied up. Now. Uh, I get a kick out of watching the Cardinals play when I was sitting up in the stands. I'm watching them from here. But when I can't even go out there and help in the tight spots, I'm telling you, Hank, it's driving me nuts. Yeah, waiting around can be pretty tough for a kid. All right, so I'm a meager beaver. Boy, Hank, with that player limit deadline coming up, well, if I don't get out there and show what I can do, how am I going to keep the uniform? Yeah, I mustn't rush things. <laughs> what do you mean, rush things? Well, just because this is my first year in the big leagues doesn't mean I can't win ball games. Uh, you remember Johnny Beasley in 42? <laughs> uh, it was his first year in the majors, too. Yeah, that was the year we took the World Series from the Yankees. Four out of five. I was a little before my time, but didn't he win two games in that series? Yeah, the second game. And Southworth put him in for the last one, too. Now the pressure's really on the Cardinals' first season wonder boy, Johnny Beasley. He's held the Bombers to only two runs up to this fifth inning. But now the bases are loaded, and Joe and Joe DiMaggio's up at the plate. Beasley winds, the pitch, swung on, a ground ball down the third baseline. Kurowski comes up with it, steps on third, force play, retiring the side. Going into the last half of the ninth inning now, the Yanks are trailing four to two. They haven't won a game since the first day of the series. And now it's their last chance to stay alive. Joe Gordon's the first man up in this inning. Beasley winds, here's the pitch, and Gordon singles to left, pulling up at first base. Next man up is Bill Dickey, the catcher. Here's the pitch. Dickey bounces one down towards second. Jimmy Brown is coming in, looks like a double play. No, he fumbles it and both players are safe. That was a tough break for the Cardinals. Joe McCarthy's going to make the most of it. He's sending in Stainback to run for Bill Dickey. Gary Pretty's up next. Third baseman comes in just a little. They're expecting a bunt. Johnny Beasley looks down to get his sign from Walker Cooper. Joe Gordon leads off second. 
The pitch, a fastball high. Cooper fires to second. Golden Manning broke down to the bank. He's out. Joe Gordon's picked off second base. Man, oh man, that was something to see. Gordon was trying to get a big lead, expecting a bunt, some 10 feet off the bag, and Marty Marion was at least that far away when Cooper threw to the empty bag. Marion got there to take the ball just in time, and umpire George Barr ruled him out. What a play, ladies and gentlemen. What a throw, and what a shortstop. Two out now. Beasley pitches. It's a ground ball down to second. Brown comes up with it. He's out, and the Cardinals win, taking four games straight from the mighty Yankees to become the world champions of 1942. Yeah, that was... Hey! Just be happy we need pitchers this year. 34 when the Dean brothers won 49 games between them. The pitching staff had nothing to do but play in the bullpen. 34, wasn't that the uh, World Series against the Detroit Tigers? Yeah. Yeah, you should have seen those Deans. Dizzy said that if Frankie Frisch would just give him and Paul the ball, they'd take care of those Tigers. And you know, <laughs> they did. Paul won two and Dizzy won the other two. The last one, 11 to nothing. Old Diz fogged that fastball of his past Mickey Cochran, Hank Greenberg, Billy Rogel, and all the rest. And he gave the pitchers and infielders as hard a time as he did the batters. Now that gas house base running got him into trouble, though, when Frankie Frisch, he was playing manager then, sent Diz in as pinch runner for Virgil Davis. The Tiger shortstop, trying for a double play, made a quick throw and clouded Dizzy on the head with the ball. <laughs> and darned if the ball wasn't harder. But not by much, though. Well, by the time they got him off the field, he was coming out of it. They took him to the hospital for x-rays. And as Dizzy always tells the story, headline his next day said, x-rays of Dizzy's head show nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and that seventh game, Dizzy shut him out and the cards went wild at the plate. In one inning, the third, I think it was, we scored seven runs off four pitchers. In the sixth, Medwick hit a triple. There's the pitch. Medwick swings. There goes the drive deep to right field. It's bouncing off of the screen out there. Medwick racing for second base. He's rounding second. He's going to try for three. Here comes the throw. It's going to be close. Medwick slides. Safe. Oh, wait a minute. Marvin Owen claims that Medwick spiked him, and the boys are into a fight. Here comes the player charging out from both teams. Looks like we have the makings of a good free-for-all here. And now the umpires are moving in, trying to get the boys quieted down. And now as Medwick takes over in left field, the Detroit Bleacherites are pelting him with vegetables. Boy, these fans are really boiling. Now Medwick is being called by Judge Landis. The commissioner is going to straighten things out. The conference is very brief. Frankie Frisch steps away, and he isn't looking very happy. Yes, Medwick has been told to leave the game so the Detroit fans will let the play continue. And Medwick's really sore. But even without Medwick, the Cardinals did okay. The final score, St. Louis 11, Detroit nothing. And the Cardinals win the World Series of 1934. Looks like we're doing okay, too. Uh -oh.
might have hit them pretty hard. Only a one-run lead now. Say, hey, do you think the skipper would give me a chance tonight? Oh, I'll bet I could get him out. Uh, pretty tough spot to break in, kid. Taking a big chance in such a close game. Yeah, I guess so. Well, you said it yourself, Hank. The Cardinals take chances. Do what they don't expect. Well, what they don't expect tonight is me. <laughs> now, take it easy. Don't get all worked up, kid. Why don't you go out the bullpen and limber up uh, just in case, you know? Well, Hank, I want you to see me buzz a few. Come on, Hank. Take it easy, kid. Take it easy. You're in no hurry. No guarantee they're even going to use you. You'd want to get all tensed up just because you might get a big break. You want to pitch your natural game. That's your best game when things get toughest. I wish you could have seen old Pete Alexander. You know, Grover Cleveland Alexander. There's a guy that stayed calm and relaxed in one of the toughest spots in all baseball history. The cards were really in the limelight in 1926. St. Louis Darner went crazy. That was the first time the Redbirds had ever played in a World Series, you know. And after that second game in New York, when Alexander polished off the Yankees six to two, well, when they got off the train here in St. Louis for the third game, the lid really blew off. You never saw so many baseball fans in all your life. There wasn't room for all of them to even stand on the street when the team drove by. So they stood three deep in office windows, any place to get a look at the heroes. And boy, they played like heroes. Big Jess Haynes fan, Koenig, Lazari, and Combs. And didn't give the Yankees a single run, but he drove in to himself. I think it was in the fourth inning he whacked a home run with Thevnow on base, which would have won the game all by itself. Only the Cards scored a couple more insurance runs and won it four to nothing. Alexander helped win his own ball games too. Pitching, hitting, and running bases in that heavy sweater he always wore. Man, oh man, that seventh game. I wasn't in the big leagues then. So when the cards weren't playing in St. Louis, I hung around the store where there was a radio out in front. That was the first World Series broadcast on a national network, you know. And I didn't miss a single play. We have the starting pitches for this seventh game, the game that will decide the series and give the World's Championship either to St. Louis or New York. For the Yankees, Wait Hoyt. And for the Cardinals, Jess Haynes. Haynes, you will remember, won the third game for the Cardinals. And now that Alexander has won two games for the Cards in this series, Haynes will try for his second. It's the last half of the third now, and the great Babe Ruth is at the plate facing Haynes. The pitch. Ruth out the towering fly ball. It's going. Yes, it's a home run. And the Mabino tucks around the bases, making the score one to nothing in favor of the New York Yankees. There's one out in the first of the fourth with Sonny Jim Bottomley out. It's a base hit. Bottomley holds up at first. Les Bell swings. Shortstop Keeney bobbles it, and Bell's safe at first. And Haiti singles to left, loading the bases and bringing up the catcher, Bob O'Farrell. The Cardinals are trailing by a run. The bases are loaded. A base hit now could put them ahead. Even a long fly could tie it up. The pitch, O'Farrell swing, a long high fly into left. Bottomley should be able to score after the catch. Hussell drops it, he lost it in the sun. Bottomley scores, the ball game tied up one to one. There's Hoyt's pitch to Tommy Thevenall, and it's a clean single for the Cardinal shortstop. Here comes Bell across the plate. 
Chick Capey scoring two, and the Cardinals are out in front three to one. And now it's Jeff Haynes coming to the plate. Listen to that crowd, to the thousands of St. Louis fans in New York today. He's a great hero. And even the Yankee fans have to admit he's pitching a terrific game as... I tell you, we were so excited there around the radio, we could hardly stand still. But all the time, old Alexander was sitting out in the bullpen under the bleachers in Yankee Stadium, calmly watching a couple of pitchers warm up. But even when the Yankees scored another run in the sixth, nobody was worried. Everybody felt sure Haynes could hang on to a one-run lead. But then in the seventh, something went wrong. Looks like something's wrong with Jess Haynes. He's getting wild. There's ball four to Lou Gehrig, moving Musell to second, leaving Combs on third. The bases are loaded as push him up Tony Lazari comes to the plate. Hornsby's going over to talk to Haynes. This Lazari is a dangerous hitter. They're looking at Haynes' fingers. He may have a blister. He's been puffing hard all day. Hornsby's calling for another pitcher. It'll probably be Shadell or... No, Alexander's coming in. Listen to the crowd. Alexander pitched only yesterday, and he wasn't even warming up out there. There he is, talking to Hornsby and pitcher Bobby Farrell. I wonder if a pitcher ever walked into a tighter situation. Base is loaded. One of the league's leading hitters at the plate, and a World Series at stake. What a moment this is. This crowd's going wild. Alexander's taking warm-up. He looks relaxed and easy. As a matter of fact, he looks like he's the calmest man in Yankee Stadium. Now Lazari is stepping into the batter's box, waving that big bat. Alexander winds. Curve ball, strike one. Lazari had a home run cut on that one. O'Farrell's out talking to Alexander. One pitch could mean the ball game here. Now he goes back to the plate. Alexander's ready. Holmes takes the lead off third base. The pitch, it's a long fly ball in the left field. It could be, it's foul. That ball went into the stand just barely to the left of the foul line marker, making it strike two on Tony Lazari and leaving no doubt where he wants to hit that ball. Alexander gets a new ball from the plate umpire, Bill Deneen. He takes his sign. The pitch, strike three. Lazari goes down swinging in a third ball. Firing the side. Ladies and gentlemen, you should hear this crowd and see the Cardinals gather around Grover Cleveland Alexander. Yet to be the oldest pitcher ever to pitch a complete World Series game. Today, the hero of heroes, the Cardinal of Cardinals. That wasn't the end of the game, was it? Practically. The next six Yankees never got the ball out of the infield. Alexander wasn't just a Cardinal. He was a Cardinal tradition. That's what you want to be, kid. Not just a cardinal picture, a cardinal tradition. Oh, it don't look so good. Come on, come on, put something on it. You never tell what's going to happen. Just like this. 